previews of other programs in the Ancient Secrets of the Bible Collector series follow this presentation. We are about to look into the pages of the first continuous recorded history of mankind in the book we call the Holy Bible. We're going to investigate some of its most controversial stories and discover the answers to some very tough questions. Is the Bible a reliable account of miraculous interventions that rescue people from sudden doom and destruction? Or is it merely a collection of legends and myths as some modern day critics claim? Leading experts, both Bible skeptics and proponents, from throughout the world have contributed to the discussion of these biblical questions that may shock and surprise you. Two determined armies have fought to a standoff, and now the outcome of their battle will be decided by face-to-face -face combat between a dreaded warrior giant and a young shepherd boy. The story of David and Goliath is a myth. Goliath the giant never existed. Goliath was a real person who had four brothers. And the duel between David and Goliath is also historically accurate. David and Goliath meet in battle, and their ancient duel becomes one of the most memorable and most controversial events depicted in the Bible. Historians and biblical experts investigate this age-old controversy and find startling new answers. Was there ever a real giant named Goliath? Or is this Bible story just pure fantasy? There never has been any historical or biological evidence to support the Bible story of David and a giant named Goliath. The only evidence we have are the stories in the Bible. And what is the Bible? Hardly reliable historical information. The evidence from ancient Israelite sources pertaining to David is so extensive that few historians today would even question any of the main details about his reign. David rose from relative obscurity to become Israel's second king. He ruled the 12 tribes of Israel as a powerful nation and founded a royal dynasty that lasted over 400 years. In biology, we're able to affirm that isolated genetic pools can and do result in unusual human forms. The very tall Watutsi people of Rwanda and the very short pygmies of the Congo are just two modern examples. At the turn of the 20th century, these Watutsi were considered legendary by many academics of that time, literally just tall tales dreamed up by explorers and adventurers to gain financial support for their expeditions. Granting that a unique restriction in a given gene pool can cause giantism, such human specimens have never been known to exceed a little over seven feet nor have any remains ever been uncovered that would support a Goliath. The remains of Genghis Khan and Julius Caesar, to mention only two of thousands of historical characters, have never been found either. But is that a credible argument that they never existed?
Is this story of David and Goliath a concocted tall tale? Or is the Bible an accurate historical document of important past events? Can these events be scientifically and historically proven to be fact? The critics and the defenders are solidly opposed. To fully understand, we must first know what the Bible said. We find our story in the Old Testament, first book of Samuel, often called by modern-day Israelis the first book of the kings because it gives a chronology and narrative history of Israel's early kings. According to the Bible, this area in Canaan between Shoko and Azekah is where the duel between David and Goliath took place some 3,000 years ago. Prior to the years of King Saul's reign, the Philistines who came from the Aegean Islands settled in Canaan after being turned away from Egypt by Pharaoh's army in 1188 BC. The Philistine army, with their Iron Age weaponry and discipline, invaded the Israelite tribal lands in Canaan. But their chariots and heavy armor were designed for battles on flat land and useless in the rocky heights. The Israelites under Saul were not a professional army. There were shepherds and farmers who became a guerrilla army defending their land with outdated Bronze Age weapons. But under Abner, Saul's shrewd general, they became formidable fighters, especially when defending their native hills. For almost six weeks, the two forces confronted each other in an impasse that neither seemed able to break. The superior Philistine forces had Saul's army bottled up within the craggy hills but could not successfully attack the guerrillas in their position. Both armies were hungry and frustrated, eager for a strategy that would break the deadlock. It was customary for the families of each tribe to send food to the army in the field, and Jesse of Bethlehem sent David with food for his warrior sons and their officers. Stand and make yourself known! Move away from the donkey! I am David, son of Jesse of Bethlehem, my three brothers fight in the army of the Lord. I bring them food. Don't you know the Philistine patrols are crawling all over here? Come, quickly, quickly, boy. But on this occasion, David was in for a shock. Good idea. Good idea. Good idea. Good idea. Hail Israel! Again, Goliath of Gath! Daily, Goliath would taunt the Israelites with insults in an attempt to lure them out into the open. Goat King, is there not one man in all your ranks who will come down here and meet me in single combat? According to which Bible scholar is telling the story, Goliath is anywhere between eight and a half to thirteen and a half feet tall. Let's face it, there was no race of giants, and not the slightest historical or scientific proof exists for such enormous people. Ancient Israelite records indicate that Goliath was from the Rephaimite tribe and that he had one or more brothers. The Rephaimite tribe had genetic peculiarities, including giants and people with six fingers and six toes. The Rephaimites resided in Gath, a city that served in Goliath's day as a base for military units with special fighting abilities. By converting the Hebrew cubit and span, we're able to determine that Goliath was nine feet six inches tall when he suited up in his armor and helmet. He's truly a giant. Did not know a man could grow that big. I spit on your nation! I spit on your buzzard king! And I spit in the face of your wormy god, Jehovah! Ah! The giant part of the Bible story is its weakest point. It suggests Goliath and his brothers were from a race of giants which there has never been a shred of valid scientific proof. Giantism is an unquestioned fact of human life. There have been many, many examples of huge people in modern times. But this is not proof that a race of giants ever existed. The Bible emphatically mentions the Anakim and the Rephaim, two tribes of giants that were destroyed by Joshua's army in his campaign through Canaan. The remnants of these tribes took refuge among the Philistines. Also, there is absolute scientific evidence of such tribes, confirmed by the archaeological recovery of oversized skeletons in Palestine. Further, these Anakim and Rephaim are memorialized on several Egyptian reliefs, which shows them to be unusually tall and fair-skinned. 
If giants did exist in this area of Canaan, which seems to be proven beyond doubt, why not one named Goliath? Saul, the first chosen king of Israel, was a brave man, frustrated by the long standoff. You cowardly slain women, wormy God, Jehovah! The boy David had never heard Jehovah cursed, and he was badly shaken with the horror. The monster has cursed the living God. Who will we send down to destroy the monster for his blasphemy? Which one of you will go? Hold your tongue, boy. Do not shame us all. You're just a noisy kid, and you do not understand. It made David sick at heart that the giant could blaspheme unchallenged. So much that he rushed to get an audience with the king. While in the king's tent, Abner was trying to convince Saul of his plan. This is all too complicated, Abner. It makes no sense to me at all. The Philistines always do battle the same. With their heavy armored phalanxes, war horses, and dreadful chariots. Deprive them of these, and we would defeat them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And how would you do that, Lord General? Their horses and chariots are here at the back of their camp in the most heavily defended place. Move the Benjamite archers up these draws on their flanks. Use fire arrows to set their camps ablaze. Create pandemonium. Move the Danite spearsmen to breach their foreguard here and here. Strike into their middle. And have the Philistine perimeter guards gone blind while you're creeping into these positions? If a diversion could be found, something to hold their whole attention until Please, we could sir, deploy these men. Let me pass. I must see the king. It is urgent. I must see his majesty. Let me in! To the veteran guerrilla fighters, David's outrage was amusing. But the shepherd boy would not be put off. Let the boy through. For over a month, in spite of the rewards King Saul offered, not one man had come forward. Till now, the frail shepherd boy pled for the chance. And the king was sourly amused. What is this nuisance? Please, Your Majesty, make me your champion, that I might slay the monster that blasphemes against God. The giant Goliath? He rages against God and against you, mighty king. I have killed bears and a lion, too, that attacked my father's sheep. And I will do the same to this monster that curses God and Israel. David's determination to fight the giant seemed so strong it gave Abner an idea. Do you value your young life so little that you would foolishly cast it away? God gave me life, Lord General. It belongs to him. What do I see in your eyes, General? I think the Lord has sent us our diversion, Majesty. The main problem I have with this story is that no army would ever risk the outcome of a battle on a single combat. It is too ridiculous for any professional soldier to even consider. A battle of champions was a common Aegean tradition of letting matched champions duel to the death to determine the winner of a battle and to avoid the bloodshed of a full-scale battle. These people genuinely believed that the stronger god was on the side of the winner, which made further combat unnecessary. In this case, it was as much a duel between Jehovah of the Israelites and Dagon of the Philistines as it was between David and Goliath. Hail Goliath of Gath! In the morning, Israel sends down a champion to answer your challenge! We can only speculate what Abner was thinking. Perhaps he thought sending a small, frail boy down to meet the giant Goliath would divert the attention of the entire Philistine camp. But he would have to thoroughly coach David to make the fight last. I will do exactly as you say, Lord General. I will delay fighting the monster, making him pursue me. We must have that time, David. You must keep away from him until our archers have reached the flanks of the pagans. Listen for the sound of the shofar. Saul awakened deeply troubled and saddened at the sight of his frail chance. Then he tried to make David put on his own heavy armor. Forgive me, Majesty, but I can't wear this armor. It's too big and too heavy. And the sword, I 
can hardly lift it. What weapon would you use against the mighty Goliath? Just my sling, great one. A simple shepherd sling? Just so, Majesty. To the archer, his bow. To the shepherd, his sling. According to the Bible, Goliath was wearing 125 pounds of Aegean scale armor, a handheld shield capable of deflecting arrows and spears, a heavy helmet and shin guards, a small leather slingshot and a tiny pebble against an adversary like Goliath puts a strain on even the strongest faith. At first consideration, a simple slingshot would seem a pretty poor weapon to take into a duel to the death. But there are strong opinions to the contrary. Records exist of slingers hurling stone missiles with enough force to shatter helmets, body armor, and even shields. It is recorded that even the ancient tribe of Benjamin had a whole army of slingers who could hit targets up to 200 feet away with lethal accuracy. The idea of David using a sling and stone to kill a professional soldier dressed in armor is as ridiculous as bringing down an elephant with a BB gun. In the Arab world today, particularly among the Palestinians, the sling continues to be used. Both the Greek and Roman armies use deadly slingers. Sling sharpshooters made up a large part of Hannibal's army in 218 BC. But is a sling a deadly weapon? As late as the Spanish Civil War in 1936, slings were being used with deadly results. Just how accurate and lethal are slingshots? We went to Stacy Grosskup to find out. He's a weapons exhibitionist skilled in archery, blowguns, rifles, tomahawks, knives, and of course, the slingshot. This sling consisting of a leather pouch and two thongs is a replica of the one carried by David. The ammo I'm going to use are marble-sized lead balls and stones. Brook stones were used by David against Goliath. These sling missiles would have been used in military combat and for hunting in ancient times. The target is a one by eight pine board at about 40 feet distance. As you can see, the ancient sling was quite effective. In the hands of an expert like David, this sling was certainly a most deadly weapon. After the long weeks of frustration, the Philistines' camp was filled with excitement for the promised spectacle of death. It was a foregone conclusion that Goliath would butcher any man the Israelites sent down. What a great butcher Goliath So, you great mountain of flesh, you found some sport for the morning. When you've slaughtered that Hebrew, you bring his head to me for my tent standard. And I promise you'll walk with me at the front of my triumph when we return to Gaza. And while the Philistines were already prematurely celebrating, Abner was readying his captains to take advantage of the diversion. Keep a company in plain view, up there cheering. Movement of several hundred men was the keys to success. Get into positions with your men and pray to the Lord God to guide your arms. Go now. And when you hear the sound of the shofar, attack! <laughs> Slay me with old age, waiting for your champion! Where is this mighty man of your dirty and diseased race? Abner had understood his enemy well. Within minutes, the entire Philistine camp was crowding forward to watch the slaughter. And Abner's captains began deploying their weapons for the attack. I am David. I accept your challenge. The shock of seeing a slight young boy come to challenge their fearsome giant drew the attention of the entire Philistine camp, from the officers down to the horse grooms. <laughs> it's blood, what? Is this? Dare you mock me? You Hebrew dung beetles! You 
send a child to make war with the greatest fighter in the world! David, a teenager who chose to wear no armor, could have easily outmaneuvered the armored giant Goliath for three medical reasons. One, those who suffer from gigantism tend to be awkward instead of quick in their movements. Two, giants tend to be weaker in their muscle strength than those who are younger and smaller in size. And three, giants typically suffer from bilateral temporal hemianopia. That's peripheral vision loss, meaning David could have easily run from side to side, staying out of Goliath's visual field while setting up his shot or provoking the giant. The Philistine giant was suddenly filled with a trembling rage. The javelin, not the spear, you stupid ox. Boy's a leaping gazelle, not a charging lion. Breaths more, my brave little man. Getting tired? You great mountain of pagan flesh. I'm going to carve you up very slowly, you wormy little pup. Just because you made me sweat. Finally, the captains led their men into the attack positions. <laughs> Shepherd Sling, do you think the great Goliath is a slinking jackal that can be stung by a pebble? Curse the living God, idol worshiper. God would deliver you into my hands. The Israelite attack was so swift and awesome that the Philistine post was destroyed in a few terrible minutes. In any court of law, the story of David and Goliath, as described in the Bible, would stand vindicated by the evidence. Experts have proven the existence of giants in both ancient and modern times. We have seen it demonstrated that the slingshot is a deadly weapon. Here's a most interesting side note to this story. This helmet is a replica of the Aegean type, probably worn by the Philistine army of that day. You will note that there is no visor. It was critically important for a soldier to keep his head tilted forward in battle to gain maximum protection. But if the wearer were to throw his head back, as Goliath may have done in a fit of laughter, this important part of his forehead was exposed 
Perhaps this was the reason visors were added to battle helmets soon after Goliath's fall. Historical and archaeological evidence proves David's existence and his many deeds, from the killing of Goliath to ruling a united Israelite nation. But there's more to this story than the killing of a giant. It's a story about a real hero. David took upon himself a challenge that no other person was willing to take. His confidence was based upon the sure belief that God would give him victory. And he was faithful to God by giving him the credit for that victory. When we pick our heroes for role models, are we selecting real heroes of substance or just heroes of clay? Something to think about.